Cross your fingers and toes. All right. We should be live again. Okay. Hopefully, theoretically, we are back on the air again. And uh, after a slight half hour glitch, let's just attribute it to demons. It's a catch all thing. It works for the religionists. Why can't we do this? That is all that. You know, it's, it's uh, all that or Marduk or something. You know, you didn't do the right thing. Anyway, um, uh, let me know if we're getting feedback from the live feed of the chat because I don't have that open as to whether or not people are hearing me and all the rest. And, and if they go, hey, hey, what well, our problem is we're hearing you. <laughs> anyway, um, we will be discussing a little bit more of Contested Bones, uh, where um, I put a link up to a paper that uh, they probably shouldn't have linked to. Uh, they were going on about um, uh, human and chimpanzee differences, and, and that it's not really 90%, not 99%, maybe only 90%. Uh, the problem is the paper they linked to from 2012 mainly was about uh, the FOXP2 gene and how uh, new methods were being developed to be able to uh, work out how genetic evolution was going on in this critical language related gene in the primates and others. The, the gene itself is an ancient one, uh, <coughs> going back to mammals uh, long before. It has nothing intrinsically to do with language, and that's what's uh, so relatively interesting about it, is there's no such thing as a language gene. There's no such thing as the self-awareness gene. There's no such thing as the uh, like chocolate cake gene. That, that in fact, all the things that we now find in our complicated meat computer are drawing on genetic systems that do other things as well. And FOXP2 is one of them. So it's just a normal regulatory system that now part of it has gotten co-opted in this FOXP2 gene that if there's a mutation in it, you have problems with developing language and grammar. So how does a, a set of code in a DNA, if you want to use the information model, how exactly does that translate into not being able to make coherent sentences in very clear ways if there's a tiny little point mutation in that, unless it's the meat computer. <laughs> and so uh, this, this it, it was fascinating that they, of all the papers that they could have riffed on for an authority quote, and that's all they cited it for was an authority quote. Um, without dealing with the content, this was a loony, a loose, them, a, a doozy. Um, it's a PNAS paper, so it was easy to do an open access on it. And, and it's now seven years old. So uh, there's been a lot of the work on it since. So that was the little part on the uh, uh, ongoing saga, it was. Uh, I noticed that it's the 100th episode of uh, going into that, yay, of uh, the endless stream of contested bones. And then I'll be really super short on the second half of the thing, which I won't even bother about doing in the second half. I'll just mention it. Uh, Nathaniel Jensen, this was information that I had uncovered while working on the Rocks Were There book, shameless plug, uh, where I went through. Uh, and just finished just in the last week, 10 years worth of acts and facts. And uh, along the way, I discovered examples of where Nathaniel Jensen, who is one of their geneticists, I give him props for honesty. He came up with this cockamamie idea that there was a differential mutation rate somehow going on to somehow accommodate lots of change in some organisms, but not so much in ours, because remember, we have to be a separate kind from all those other pesky little animals. And everywhere he looked, no. <laughs> so he had to go, I don't know how to accommodate that. Oh, we'll keep you posted. Well, we'll see how it keeps him posted. But the other fun thing that I'm putting into the book has to do with the fact that what you get in like the answers book series is an upper level mantra. Whereas underneath it all is a huge debate that's going on almost on every single aspect of creationism. And you don't see that uh, as to what a kind is uh, and what the range of it is and how much speciation there is and whether natural mutation occurs. Um, uh, if you read at Answers in Genesis, you'll kind of think that natural mutation and natural selection is accepted, okay? not an institute for creation research <laughs> they're insisting that it's a fallacy and that it's a satanic thing and they're still digging their heels in on it and there's been a pot shot back and forth between um uh jason lyle for some reason because he's a physicist what the hell is he talking about genetics for good <laughs> interesting 
and uh, Gene Leitner got involved in it, and uh, uh, Randy Galu uh, Guliusa was the main one who was uh, pushing things. He had a long series of intractably, impenetrably boring uh, discussions of natural selection. I even I, in the book, I'm saying, if you have the stomach for this, please, you can go and read and try to find anything in there. Almost no discussion of taxa. It's all a complete authority quote argument uh, for why natural selection is just wicked and anti-biblical. Uh, meanwhile, because why use data? Yeah, why use data? Yeah. And and uh, so there's a, a couple little taxa that he kind of floats past along the way, but nobody really grapples on those sorts of things. So they can't, even though the ones that accept natural selection, theoretically, Jensen and others, they don't use it. <laughs> they don't let it be used because unfortunately, if you let it be used, you're going to discover that we're a product of natural selection. <laughs> and that's given the whole game away. Um, but the, the when the flood began, that's another gigantic one. The floating forest model uh, that Kurt Wise is still pushing, not if you read <laughs> Institute for Creation Research. <laughs> they decided, no, this is a mess. This doesn't work at all. <laughs> and so almost every, there, in fact, one creationist, I found about this one because Glenn Morton and that absolutely delightful book, uh, uh, where a bunch of ex-creationists have wrote, written a bunch of chapters explaining, first of all, why they became ex-creationists and also the variety of evidence. And Glenn Morton um, happened to allude to um, uh, this one bit where one of the creationists in 2009 held, threw up his hands in despair and said, there's not a single deposit anywhere on earth that we could attribute to the flood. <laughs> So, so that that's that's the advantage of reading closely what they actually say that you get, and this has been going on really for a long time. There's a whole section that I put in from one of my favorite nincompoops in the creationism community, which is Woodmorap, and he is always back patting himself as how brilliant and wonderful he's kind of a Donald Trumpian sort in that respect. And uh, here's a whole slew of papers he did way back in the 1970s and 80s. And normally I had not paid a heck of a lot of attention to the older creationist stuff. Uh, I've got masses of the back issues of, of the Creation Research Society quarterly and all that kind of stuff back before it became online. <laughs> so I had all these little hard copy examples. Uh, and I realized I knew I would want to go back and ferret through all of that eventually. Well, as a spot bit for this new book, I'm examining some of this stuff. And, and there was a particular copy, that uh, um, issue of these mega sequences and the geological record and the sequence of it. Is the, the geologic record a, a fair representation of what went on or not? Is, is the fact that the Cretaceous is after the Permian, meaning that the Cretaceous is after the Permian, even in a flood context? And so there you get into, or is it all just due to this ecological zonation and differential thing and just you know yeah uh and so both of us have been bumping into things from the the snelling answers in genesis book series and also that those black loon papers that kurt wise wrote <laughs> in 2002 and 2005 he even there's even schizoid about the pacambrium one of the things that that's going to be a big i'm writing on this right now so it's literally right in front of my eyeballs hey me too is that um, is the Precambrian laid down in the flood or is it earth, stuff that was alive in the creation week that then got sloshed when the flood came in? And they can't quite make up their mind on that one. And the problem is there's too much water. The thing that is absolutely obsessively problematic about the flood is there's too much water. <laughs> because if you have ocean and critters living in ocean, how do you put a fence to make sure that one set of critters doesn't move next door to the next set of critters? So why magic. is it that you magic? Yeah, it. Uh, and, and I, I was just putting into the master index that hilarious paragraph you have of all these different fish, <laughs> the gobies and all that. And that um, that how come not one of them ever ends up in the same deposit as the Ediacaran biota or Paleozoic biota. No placoderm ever guides the dust next to a modern teleos, you know, <laughs> ever, not ever. Yeah, it's and, uh, and, convenient. <laughs> yeah, how convenient, yeah. And so what, you're, what we're looking for is the paleobiogeography, and that was the whole bit about this, this uh, coming attraction thing. 
I would contend, and Jackson, I believe, will say the same thing. They ain't ever going to do this. <laughs> that no matter how you shuffleboard the pieces, it's never going to fit the flood model because the flood didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. Duh. So yeah. what you end up with is they have to parse things down and wiggle word things down and avoid specifics because the moment they bring up a specific, we get to look at the specific. We get to look. Um, there's a beautiful section that I, I, I'm, I'm giving credit to Glenn Morton for having done all this. He pointed out, I, I phrased it a little differently in the way I'm doing this, is creationists should avoid bringing up Texas. <laughs> Not only the Paluxy River tracks, that's, there's a whole subsection on that. But in Texas alone, you have got Permian seaways, you've got coal seams, you've got humans hunting mammoths, you've got <laughs> dinosaurs, you've got temperate climates, oceanic environments, you've got ice ages, all happening simultaneously if the flood's true. I'm sorry, even Texas ain't big enough to handle that kind of a situation there. And because the water, again, too much water, water. the water should be swooping stuff along. The, we know what a tsunami looks like. We know what hurricanes look like. You'll end up with a boat in your backyard. You'll end up with all of this debris that has been mushed together because the water is really not finicky and tidy. It goes ker splash. And yet we have to believe with the most Martha Stewart-ish precision <laughs> that the flood manages to tidally keep everything sorted away in this zonation model. And it, it's just plain loony. And the more you look at the material, the more you look at the taxa, here's, here's the problem with the Cambrian. This is what makes it so much fun, is that back in the 1970s and 80s, how much we didn't know about the Cambrian. We didn't have so much of the, of the logger statement that we have. We didn't have phosphatization material from Precambrian embryos. We didn't have all of those fossil trackways available. You know from 2004, um, uh, uh, James Valentine's book, that he is just diving into that new material because of, of typical technical work of that type is relating to the stuff that's coming on stream in the 80s and 90s. And so he's starting to mention all this stuff. Well. Since then, more and more and more information has called along and paleo climates and paleo uh, reconstructions. Uh, uh, one of the things that I was just uh, putting a little note in on is Tim Clary, bless him, made the mistake of mapping the stromatolites of the Precambrian world in the pre-flood model. All of his stromatolites all over the planet. What model did he use for the landmass? Pangea. Except with this model, I noticed that the sea levels indicated that all of Eng all of Europe is underwater. All of it. And I was looking over the horizon past into like where Middle East, Asia might be, because like where is Eden? Couldn't you like put a little star on the map saying Eden? Because that's the model that he is suggesting, that all of this is taking place in the creation week, that there are somewhere or other all of these stromatolites going on doing their little shtick, uh, and that at the same time, Adam and Eve and the kids and the docile dinosaurs wandering around being petted. Eating uh, watermelons. In, eating watermelons. Um, all of that's happening simultaneously. They don't even have the integrity to be able to mark up their own model. This reminds me of, of a map that, that popped up in the Book of Mormon, of, 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 not in the Book of Mormon, but in, a, in an apologist on it. If you try to find a map of the pre-Columbian world according to the Book of Mormon, where all of these tribes and people that are mentioned in the Book of Mormon are, you not find any of it in their official publications. They avoid this like a plague. So that um, uh, you find that it's always um, just a guy who's trying to make sense out of all of what they're teaching him. So he makes a map that is just a squiggly map with sea on the north and sea on the south. And one or two city name place names are. And you have no clue where this is in relation to the actual North America. But 
don't we have an actual North America? There's Florida, there's Ohio, there's all of it. Where, where is all of this taking place? There is and that's definitely because, Ohio. Because they can never make it fit, no matter how hard they push and shove, the pre-Columbian data is never going to fit the Book of Mormon. Well, Tim Clary and all the rest are in exactly the same boat on flood geology. That, except, whereas you're talking about a relatively limited time frame of only a few thousand years of human history in this little overlap window, you're talking about half a billion years of Metazoan life involving paleoclimate on paleoclimate and shifting continents and seas being subducted and ice age going on. And I mean, the, the sheer range of the data field that needs to be accounted for is so colossal that they ain't ever going to pull this trick off if they have a hundred million years to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a spectacular show. Yeah, it, it's, I, in fact, I, I couldn't avoid putting a phrase in. So this thing is is a show that needs Michael Bay to do an IMAX movie on it. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's yeah, that, that there are, um, a point that Glenn Morton brought out, and, and I quoted it because it was so beautiful, uh, it was so succinct, is they have a problem with ocean sediment. See, if you think about mountains up here and oceans down here, flood comes along, fountains of the deep squirt up, land gets deposited, sediment settles, blah, 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 dead critters, okay? All magically turning into rock at fantastic speed. Problem is, if that's true, then the ocean sediment should be way thicker than the stuff on the continents. And he said, you can experiment like this. Take, take your damn bathtub fill up with a bunch of bricks in some section and dump a bunch of dirt in there, it's going to settle more in the bottom than in the top. It can't avoid that. It's hydrodynamics. Physical gravity does that. So how do you get so little sediment? Now, we know why there's relatively little sediment on the seafloor because of plate subduction. But the flood... seafloor is spreading. Yeah. And so that there's a very little, I don't think there's any uh, Cretaceous uh, or a pre Cretaceous uh, a seafloor of any note at all. I think it's it's, the oldest is 180 million years old. So that's what Jurassic, late Jurassic, Jurassic. Okay, that far back, yeah. And so what you have is that there's a reason why there's so little sediment on the seafloor. So all the calculations, well, there's all this sediments coming down. The earth can't be old. Yeah, I'm afraid it can't. But from their creationist model, they have to accommodate for why there's so much seafloor or sediment on the land and so little on the seafloor. The only way they can get around it is to reverse. They have to bring the continents down and push the sea level up so that the sea parts are actually above waterline, so they're or the, uh, the line of the other, and then reverse them again. Thousands of feet of whoom, whoom. <laughs> yeah, that's what they would have to do if they actually had thought through the problem. And of course, needless to say, there's a certain difficulty with that argument. Oh, no, 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 no. Exactly. I mean, um, the, the sheer range of stupid that is going on in, in the evasion of the, tech, of the material, then we layer onto that the fact that so many examples of creationists are misrepresenting the sources that they're citing to where they, Tim Clary, we've got examples of him citing technical literature where it doesn't say what he just said it did. We've got Andrew Snelling, we've got Menton, oh, so many of these people who clearly are not paying close attention to their own source base. And you can't build a legitimate argument on that. So now we've got them in an, in an even worse vice. A, they don't have a model, which they can never come up with because they can never deal with the data. And even in their own apologetics, the pathetic little remnant, the silly cartoon that they present of their model, they're misrepresenting their sources. They're bearing false witness. Why are we supposed to be taking any of these people seriously? We can't. It's 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 just impossible to do. Do you so want to do your your uh, halftime show? Oh oh yeah. Let me. Uh, I wish to thank, as usual, to uh, to remind people that. It's because of all of your help that I'm able to do all of this stuff. And I am working as much as I can on this project and I keep working at it. So as a retiree, I'm a certainly not unbusy one. So let me thank all of our patrons who have been uh, uh, gracious enough and helpful enough to step up and actually be able to help. I know some people uh, uh, are in financial circumstances where they have to finally give up on it and uh, that's the, as the case thing may be, but every single person who has helped has helped enormously. Uh, our colleagues Hendrel and Eric Rowley and Speed of Sound and Surus 
our researchers, Travis Adams and Convert Me and Eat Meal and James Fitzwater and Ralph McFadden and Pelogia and Benjamin Simpson and Ugly German Truths. Our assistant researchers, Mike Apple and Ian Chan and Dorenko and Totas Real. Our friends, Daniel and Stephen Bauman and Mary Gail Beddoes. Insects are cool. Martin Nielsen, Popolophagus, Bo Halbo and Steigles and Alex and Paul and our legacy patrons who were able to help in previous times, Jen and Jody and John and Keith and Andrew and Dyer and Yui and Mona and Brad and Daniel and Yana and Sun Sky Stone and Everett and Sewer and Zeshi. Thank you. We've all been enormously helpful and it's made life a tad um, easier each time because uh, the, the sheer process of working on the tip project as well as books i don't print out hard copy of the books that i've done i i literally have no other than the physical um uh, proof copy that i ordered from amazon when i i did the book i don't have like a giant stack of printouts i gave up printing the bibliography years ago uh it would literally be thousands of pages of material if i tried to do that so that's not what i do with printing however I do do stuff of being able to print up draft material. This shows you how my mind, horrible mind works. Um, for example, here's the text that I had printed up uh, and on the vacation time, these are my notes that I had put on while I was over in Thanksgiving, putting in my notes and saying this goes here and this goes here. That's why I put in a little thing there and that is about Tim Clary on his uh, uh, Precambrian stromatolites and the spot in the text where I wanted to insert all of that stuff. And for me, I'm one of the old farts that has to run from hard copy on things. And as well, a uh, brand new paper just came up today. I had to print a hard copy. I saved the PDF, printed up the first page of it. Uh, that new paper that Kunin uh, um, just did uh, from uh, in, in biology, current biology, uh, where they're looking at the dynamics of how even a deleterious mutation in conjunction with a second mutation can end up linking up and overcoming an adaptive peak. The very thing that the Michael Behe's and uh, Tompkins's and stuff are insisting can't possibly happen. And all the various critics of Lenski and all that and the creationist movement. Sorry, but these things happen. And uh, that's how it works in the biology department. Uh, it's, it's a constantly expanding field. Uh, I've had to um, focus so much on doing the work that I have a whole dining room table full of the things with the little boxes on them that need to be put into the reference bibliography. And that's pretty much most of the back, you know, probably the last eight or nine months worth of PNAS and science and nature. Most of that stuff I just is on the pending rack. Uh, the stuff that immediately gets put in are stuff that's relating directly to the current project and stuff that's like so critical that I think, uh oh, some creation is going to riff off of this little buddy. So I'd better put that in the reference space because I, I operate by being able to maneuver through my data field that I have in my reference bibliography in the same way that in writing this book, it really starts coalescing once all the text is in a single doc file so that you can do those text searches and see continuity issues. And I'll be reinforcing all of that come January when I'm back from vacation, uh, when I'll be finishing off the other chapters. And by then, if luck holds, I will finish chapter seven tonight. If the passes are screwed up, that's the quality of me. I won't be leaving tomorrow anyway, uh, and that will give me a little bit more time to work on it. But hopefully, if the snow doesn't hit or is not too bad to where I can drive over the past, I'm out of here tomorrow and won't be back until after New Year's. Um, but um, all of that stuff then, will, 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 having an absolutely comprehensive uh, reference index, I was just putting in Gobi Fish and all the other little bits and pieces on there. At the moment, it's running at a, about 100 pages of listings for the index, and that'll be compacted down once it's put multiple columns and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the reference bibliography is currently at 10 point uh, over um, uh, 200 pages long. Jesus Christ. Yeah, and so we're probably how in the 3,000-ish many... uh, range of material. So that's uh, that's there. how many sources we have, around 1,000? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, about yeah, about 3,000, about 3, yeah. yeah oh it's, it's bigger than, than the other. And in, uh, for one thing, because an awful lot of the stuff is relating to directly going after particular creationist history. And so there's an awful lot of, of uh, 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 just repetition of where you find Hebert and others just rattling on Tompkins would throw out the same arguments again and again and again and again. I, and we want to have that in the reference bibliography so people can go through and follow up and do their own research and thing because that pulls all of this material together. I. I think when a creationist is reading an issue of the acts and facts like this, 
it's in a blurb of the month and then the month and then the month. So they're seeing the, the, the metras being repeated again and again and again. They're going to see there are some little references at the bottom of the page. So it's science-y. They're offering sources. See? And they're not going to really... And they're not going to actually go and look any of that stuff up. They're just reinforcing it. So they get into this kind of lull of mantra mode. Whereas if you step back and start cataloging the claims they're making to where, okay, Nathaniel Jensen, fine and dandy, the argument you made to begin with was wrong. Jeffrey right. Tompkins, the argument you did to begin with is wrong. You're repeating it year after year, month after month for the faithful doesn't make it any less wrong. It's still just as wrong, no matter how many times you repeat the same links to the uh, prior papers. And that's the kind of thing that then when you see that scale of the mantra repetition, and then, of course, the example of where the creationists are at each other's throats, disagreeing over the things. I can't think of any doctrine offhand that's necessary for creationist lore that they have any unanimity of view on. That, um, uh, for example, can giraffes evolve from a short neck form? Jesus well, is God. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's probably it. Although they don't allow, they don't allow a, a liberal um, uh, Christians who accept evolution to have that. They're apostates. They're not really Christians, and so you get that aspect of it. I did, but it noticed something interesting um, that um, Ken Ham. It seemed was okay with climate with anthropogenic climate change in an interview following his debate with Bill Nye, but then uh, I was doing some research recently, and yet they have a guy who's part of an anti-climate change group writing for the Answers book, so I wonder if he slid backwards on that one. I don't know. Oh, well, no, he just he's just as an idiot. Uh -huh. um, uh, that, that Ham doesn't understand. You, you, you well know about what... Um, I'm, I'm writing it into the text to describe it because of the fact that Ham... Um, has to deal with the fact that Andrew Snelling comes along and flat out accepts the asteroid impact now. Right. Well, they both do. That, that killed off Ch the, the Chichilub impact. Yeah. He says, there's no doubt about it. This is solid evidence. Yeah, well, Ken, ha Ken Ham has been dithering on about this for years. His entire worldview, both at the Institute for Creation Research and Answers in Genesis, that, and they have overlap, but they're not identical. That they have all been hammering away on this. No, is one one guy, Tim Clary, in fact, even insists that there's no crater there. He goes that wow. far, even though he was aware of the sources. Now, what is what kind of cognitive dissonance is going through Ken Ham's head now to be told by Andrew Snelling that that thing actually happened, except it's all connected up to the flood? I suspect it's because he never bothers to read his own stuff. Probably not. I don't think he, re otherwise he wouldn't make the statement. He, he um, uh, we, we mentioned in the book that Ken Ham is still uh, uh, accepting the idea that uh, there's no horse evolution long after the baromenologists have pretty much thrown in the towel on horse evolution. Well, it's because he doesn't read baromenology. He, he may know about it as a buzzword in the same way that Kent Hovind knows about it as a buzzword, as has been demonstrated in various debates well, it's with horse him. horse variation, not evolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, horse, it's variation within kind. This is where you get into a hissy fit, because one block is willing to just follow Wise and Wood and company off the, the gangplank and accept that Heraclitherium. For those of you who don't know, you have to keep, keep in your mind a, 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 a threat of bush of various horse forms. I mean, it's not a beeline as they thought back in the 19th century uh, to Equus. But the point is, is that the earliest models like Heracotherium are very small. They're about the size of a collie dog. They don't look very horse-like. They look more, if you look at them running around, you might think it was a deer, uh, that, that, that kind of thing. Anyway, that the baromenology evidence doesn't see any way to parse those out of the picture they just stop looking after that but there's no way that you can isolate heracotherium from the next one in the series and the next one in the series and the next one in the series and by the time then you get down to ones where they're losing the toes and all of that you know where exactly are you parsing ah but the problem is that for some creationists to go from heracotherium to horse is just too much. It's that cognitive problem again. If you looked at this, you'd go, that's not a horse. 
that can't be a horse. That can't be the horse. Because science. Because science. So they've got to draw the line at they want to keep the ones that look more horseish on the barrowman and then keep Heracotherium separate. And, and I can understand why they would also be worried about that, because if you let Arachotherium in the same monobaramin as Equus and Dinohippus and Mesohippus and all those others, how the hell are you going to differentiate between Homo Galax and Heracotheria? Homo Galax looks almost identical and has only minor diagnostic differences between them, except it's enough to differentiate it over time because that's what leads off to the tapers. So if you have now Homo Galax and Heracotherium in the same monobaramin, then you're going to eventually end up with tapers and horses all being in the same monobaramin. And, and then Heracleus. how are you going to keep Heracotherium and Homo Galax from connecting up with the Phenacodonts? And by chains, all of that, now you've got all the parasitacles. And notoungulates, and then the carnivorans, and the, what comes next? Uh, Chiropterans, and Eulipotyphlans, and Boreotherians. Exactly. And, and that's why they... When push comes to shove, 100% of creationists always have to avoid applying that yardstick of speciation. They have to really not ever think clearly, example by example, of what exactly is the supposed boundary layer of natural variation that can occur with a speciation event. Whereas I am looking at it from the reverse angle that once you have a measuring stick of how much finch beaks can vary and how much uh, body length can vary and how much even within a particular species, look at Pekingese and uh, um, uh, St. Bernard's, uh, how much variation can go on there and how natural all of that is and how easily that can be done. Now you have a measuring stick. Well, apply it to the past. So every organism the ones that, that Kent Hoven is convinced can't ever have babies, but every one of them definitely had parents, that that produces a penumbral measuring stick. Every organism has a ghost around it of potential speciation events that may or may not have been captured in the fossil record. And so now, how are you going to go through the ones where you have a really detailed fossil record and not see that measuring stick applying to connect up the dots, unit by unit by unit? which then translates into the fact that they never can work out what they would accept as a transitional form, ever. 100% failure rate on that. Now, I know of no instance, and this is why it becomes a diagnostic question from a source methods point of view, that you, anybody that wants to engage with anti-evolutionists need to work out areas where they have a good familiarity with the fossil data and a good familiarity with the genetics that would be relevant to how that form is developing uh, uh, evolutions of hearts and all that for generic bits for all vertebrates uh, down to the difference between feathers and scales and the role of bone morphological protein in the uh, um, um, plaque codes and all of that kind of stuff. All of that comes to bear. Now you say, okay, creationist, you don't like transitional form X, goody gumdrops. Let us posit for the sake of argument that the fossil record agrees with you, that there are no transitional forms. You've got this one X, which normal people would see as a transitional form, but you're insisting isn't. Okay, now let's put it over on the corner. Let's bring on a hypothetical perfect transitional form, one which you would go, well, duh, now that's a transitional form. Fine, it has whatever characteristics. You need to figure out what they are. Now, how can we tell those two animals apart? How can you tell the one that you claim is not a transitional form from the one that you would accept as a transitional format if it existed. Please differentiate that for us. You'll find that if they try to do that with birds, as an example, or therapsids, or uh, uh, early uh, uh, whales, or hominids, steam carts coming out of their ears, they cannot think about this issue. They cannot apply their model. They, so they have to kind of hold speciation and genetic variation and homeobox genes and cis regulators and uh, retrotransposons and all of this stuff at arm's length, never pulling all the pieces together. Meanwhile, uh, like uh, uh, I'm sounding like uh, uh, Colbert in the show. Meanwhile, <laughs> you've got the real scientists and what do they do? I suspect Jackson's about ready to nod his head at what I'm about to describe. When 
Scientists are trying to make sense of paleontology and biology. They are pulling together every discipline they can think of. They're drawing in the evidence that they can get from biogeographical data. They're, they're, all of these are the features that distinguish the real science. And when you go over to the cartoon version yes. <laughs> that you get with Clary and Snelling and Woodmerap to where they tiptoe around data field, like the, I was just writing and reading the section that you had done and, and making the adjustments for the part where you were saying, Snelling tries with a straight face to say that dinosaurs belong to the gymnosperm period and mammals are in the angiosperm period. Right. And he uses waffle words to do it. Even, he says predominantly. Yeah, exactly. That's sort of it. Adela Bacillus and uh, Megazostrodon would have, you know, words to say about actually, you know, we're not with the angiosperms. Uh, exactly. And so what you've got is dinosaurs and mammals and gymnosperms and angiosperms. There are times when they're all at the same time. But if you move backwards in time to early Triassic, you don't have full dinosaurs yet. You don't have any angiosperms. You've got almost mammals, though. And then you move forward in time. Well, another thought experiment that I like to put up that everybody can do, and you can pick the example that you want to use to illustrate it, is that map of time bit where I've been bugbearing everybody that anti-evolutionists just don't have a map of time in their head. Boop, none. It's not that it's just faulty. It's, it's a book with no pages, and if they had pages, they would be blank. That they literally don't have a conception of this. We just have scribblings in it. Just yeah. inane and they look. God done it. No <laughs> evolution. Boop, done. Um, so when you imagine a particular time slice, you think about all the organisms that are alive at that, the best that you can determine based on the paleontological record. And you then start moving forward from that time slice or backward from that time slice. Guess what we're going to see? things start looking more and more different from what you started out as. And the farther you go, the more variation that you have seen. So that as you move backwards from it, you start finding things that look pretty much like the things that eventually evolve into the later stuff. And as you move forward, you're starting to see those groups diversify and change and mixes going on. But there's a, there's a, a trajectory to all of that. And I don't, yeah, jump in. I was actually um, doing work on a secret project, and I bumped across a paper, uh, not the one you're thinking of, a different one, uh, where I, uh, <laughs> lots of secret projects, um, a paper detailing an example of speciation in the fossil record of not just one, but a complex of speciation events in this early ungulate called Hyopsidus. Ooh. Ooh. You, yeah, basically. Yeah, we're going to have to make sure I got that in the bibliography. Okay, um, it's kind of an older paper, but what's really mm -hmm. neat about it is they have this formation, and so they're looking through the different stratified layers, and you have this one single species, then you have a split, then this one splits into two more, which splits into more, and so that'd be have, Van Valen. That'd be Gingrich, Philip Gingrich. Gingrich, Phil Gingrich. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah, he's a big mammal guy. It was uh, it's pretty neat, and so it's like not only do you have speciation in you know the lab and in the field. You also have it in the fossil record. Yeah, there are there are examples of that where uh, you're. But we have to remember what does the speciation event look like? You know, is it like like suddenly it's like going from red to blue in right. one lump? No, what you have is is a, a, a vague zone, and the thing that is so revealing is that some of the taxonomical uncertainty that occurs in trying to pin down what a species is and what genera something is, is precisely because every once in a while you're bumping into speciation events. Yeah. But that's why there's the vagueness because it's in the process of fissioning off a new species. That's why there's such an awkwardness is to figure out whether or not it's this or that. And remember the Linnaean classification system by definition forces you to pigeonhole. Mm -hmm. So it, and for that matter, cladistics, doesn't really deal. That's one of the criticisms that um, uh, well, Stephen Jay Gould had about it, is that it doesn't deal with almosts. <laughs> it can't deal with a nearly. <laughs> right. Well, I don't think there's any uh, systematic uh, approach that deals uh, necessarily with 
with the process of speciation because you're dealing with populations and so how would yeah. you you know categorize populations within a species as almost um so yeah i mean it's you know nature doesn't really care what we think or think about or it. how yeah. we classify and we know organisms. there's a whole if you want to google a fascinating term just look up incipient speciation that or, there's a whole bunch of examples of things that are species in aggregates. the process or, or just ones that have just done that. Uh, some of it would take, you know, 10,000 years to pull off completely. So you're going to sit around and watch all of that. But every possible stage of speciation phenomenon can take place. Sometimes once in a while, you'll find an organism that can flip quickly. And, and by definition, speciation events do not involve major morphological change. They can't. They've got to be something that's virtually identical with just a little tweak. And it's the idea of what can happen with the tweaks over time so that lineages that have certain levels of tweaks can end up with descendants that look very different from the ones at the beginning. And the perfect example are the basal group that's leading off eventually to the synapsids and the diapsids. If you were to look at their common ancestor, which one would you be able to see before they started to develop that second skull hole as to which lines they're going to be going off to and who could anticipate that one set of descendants of those are going to make wonderful Thanksgiving dinners and another set of the descendants of those are going to be monstrous animals that live in the sea and eat plankton and sing songs to each other. How would you be able to anticipate that? But that's what happened over hundreds of millions of years, step by step by step by step by step by step by step. Uh, or look up uh, species aggregates or species complexes, which you know, kind of like what you were saying. You have yeah. the little, all the different stages. Um, the Heliconius butterfly of, of South America is one example yeah. where you have the wing patterns, which are all ever so slightly different across northern South America. They've just got yeah, all the and another steps. another set of terms. Um, um, because Eldridge comes from a, Niles Eldridge comes from more of a cladistic background in paleontology. He will use some of these terms and others. And in the book that he wrote about reinventing Darwin is an excellent book, relatively easy read. You can probably find it in the library or download it from some spot or other. Uh, I think it came out in 1995 and Philip Johnson riffed off of it, mangling some of the stuff. So I alluded to it uh, in tip at one point, but it was very useful in his explanation of the speciation process he argues, for example, that it's not that speciation rates go up after mass extinctions. They don't. There's per fun functionally a, a, a standard boring oh, speciation Bruce rate Lieberman on average. Bruce makes the same point, yeah. It's successful speciation that goes up after extinction events because the deck is cleared. There's suddenly a field of opportunity of unfilled niches. The other bit, he goes on the two terms that I had not known about until I'd read his book that pop up in the population literature. They're not ubiquitous, but they're there are deems and avatars, uh, D-E-M-E -E and avatar, just like the movie, uh, that relate to population subclusters and genetic subclusters that are occurring in a species before it can fission off and all of that. And so anyway, uh, um, you can Google all that kind of stuff or read his book to give good little definitions of that. And so it, it, it reminds us that a population is not a blob. It's a series of breeding units that also have genetic mixtures. And then in, in squirrels, uh, the chipmunks, uh, I guess it was chipmunks rather than squirrels, um, that uh, Sullivan, I think his name is, um, starts with an S. Anyway, he did a wonderful lecture at one of our uh, Darwin Day things at EWU a few years back. And uh, I was thinking of uh, the speciation and skip chipmunks. Well, you know, actually it was an immensely interesting thing because it turns out you can't understand vertebrate speciation without understanding what's going on in the mitochondria because mitochondria have their own little DNA packages going on. So they are operating as a break on the population mixes going on. And so you end up with hybridization zones where you can very quick, easily delineate the dynamics that's what's going on when you take into account the fact that there's one set of DNA from the nuclear DNA from the chipmunk itself and another set of DNA going on with the mitochondria, now the mixtures become much more intelligible. And there's quite a lot of technical literature that's been done on that. So that you can, you can, you can uh, give a really quick answer because it will only take one word. Have you ever seen anything in all the reading that we've done so far of Tompkins and Jetson and Carter and all the gang at AIG and ICR 
on genetics and population biology and anything remotely like that level of detail? No, no. not really. Never. Not once. In fact, I was blown away by how superficial both Sanford and Jensen's books were. These are ones that get touted in the creationist blogosphere as these important works, genetic entropy, this may... When I finally saw the damn thing, this thing is threadbare. It's very slim work. And the same thing for Jensen's thing. I mean, you uh, the, the, the hardest thing about it is the, is the hard copy cover. Of it that's the, everything else is pretty pretty flyweight in there oh. this is an overblown essay this is not a book yeah he uh, yeah the uh sanford's one of sanford's primary lines of argumentation is just a complete misreading of a few technical papers i mean yeah. it's it's hilarious how Which poor he these repeats, arguments are he repeats that mistake ad nauseum and, and if, you, if, if you start off with a misunderstanding of how the genetic mix works and how neutral mutations function, the, the irony, of course, is that the, the people involved uh, have continued to do work. Um, uh, they continue to do analyses and figured out what's going on. The same thing applies over in geology. There was a, an example of where I think it was Clary again who cited an old 2000 paper on uh, the uh, Chicheloup crater that was done uh, where he's arguing and doesn't offer a source citation other than this one paper. And it didn't say what the rest of the paragraph said, which is supposedly that drill cores going down through the Chicheloup crater were not finding the evidence of heat shock melting that were supposed there should be mile thick of all of this stuff underneath it, according to the standard evolutionary dogma. Well, the paper in question never claimed that to begin with and nothing about this supposed drill core thing. Well, Guess who, over the last decade, has done meticulous work in their team doing drill core work in Chicheloo, writing paper after paper on the subject, and never got mentioned by Clary? Same scientist. And so what you got is, is, is blatant data exception. This is a thing that I've been banging a drum on in many opportunities, and uh, everybody should continue with it is when you're looking at those cute little footnotes at the bottom of the page in the creationist literature, um, look to see what the dates are. If somebody cites a work, they're writing in 2018 and they're citing a work from 2000 on a field that's an active area of research, you're going, why are you citing a 2000 paper? Or worse, Snelling pops up on this thing. There was some of the older material that you bump into. Uh, selling 1995 doing stuff on um, you know, some New Zealand rock deposits, and you find out that they're from 19th century books. Yikes. Yikes, indeed. And problem is, there were technical literature that had been done on the meantime, and uh, since then. Yeah, I would imagine so. Duh, yeah. So it's suspicious when they're really old like that. One of the things that I would be making sure in part of my little anal retentive thing for this book to where I check everything. <laughs> it's that in every possible instance, I want to document and make sure everything is nailed down with as up-to-date of material as possible so that anybody that gets our little book, uh, little book, little book uh, yeah. will have a, a huge resource of accurately depicted, meticulously documented material that will be uh, as accessible as possible. We, we've cross-checked on all the web uh, links that are in there are active. Uh, so I, I, I find that out whenever I'm doing the little web link thing on that. I don't, in my own book, I, I don't bother with the direct web link element. And so I'm also able to cite material that is no longer available online, which is how I did Krieger. <laughs> that stuff where, um, and every once in a while, you'll find things where, um, whoops, it's gone from the internet. Well, hard copy can matter. And so that can make a little difference on that. But always be bothered about the older sources and then work through the model. Um, uh, if creationists want to present their flood model, fine and dandy. I'm still waiting for it. That they, they haven't really thought through what they think happened. So if you were to go into the Wayback Machine to October 31st, 2350 BC, are you before or after the flood? And if you got in your little time machine and work forward, just like uh, another little example that I'll be bringing up is the microscope matter is uh, you had brought up microbiota, uh, the, the gut microbi and all that, and, and how presumably dinosaurs would have had that. All these critters would have had that. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, if you were to have uh, gone in with a microscope and looked at the little things at the time, you would see things like this. 
Well, what would a creationist claim? What, what parasites were made with organisms? When exactly did they become parasite -y? How much did God intend for them to be parasiting in order to design them that way? I mean, is this kind of a little sadist? I like to see little tiny creatures living in other little tiny creatures. You know, there's there's um, a certain degree of I'm I'm riffing off of um, uh, Napoleon in Time Bandits, just in case oh you're goodness. wondering. <laughs> yeah, um, if you haven't seen Time Bandits, it's a hilarious movie that you'll either love or hate. It's it's very my pop my my put a little a mighty Monty Python esque, and um, uh, Ian McKellen or no uh, uh, Ian oh uh, Ian Holm who played um, Bilbo Baggins in the Lord of the Rings thing. So you would instantly recognize him from that. He was uh, very early in his film career back in the 1970s when he played is just a little minor part um, Napoleon in um, uh, where the time bandit, the little dwarves have stolen the map of time from God and they're running around stealing things using it. It's a, it's a clever humorous plot. And they bump into Napoleon. They're trying to steal all this stuff from it. And Napoleon is, is likes the fact that they're short because he's taller than they are. And he's talking about that Alexander the Great is a little runt, he's only five foot two. And they've all gotten kind of drunk at the end of the thing. And, and he says, you know, he likes to see the Punch and Judy shows because he says, he likes to see little people hitting other little people. That's, uh, that's kind of how the God of the Old Testament comes across. <laughs> if all these organisms and parasites over that way, and it's one of the things that affected Charles Darwin that uh that With he the found Ichnumana that parasite day. issue yeah. really creepy if it was designed it's understandable not uncreepy if it's evolved but at least it doesn't have the idea that some sadist is deliberately intending all of these things to do that there was an oh, oh there's a particular variety of of um uh, organism that, that parasitizes crustaceans crabs and it castrates them and turns them nice. into a feeding machine isn't that sweet that's yeah, uh, yeah, that's uh, that kind of reminds me of the um, uh, there's a worm. I don't remember if it's the horsehair worm or what, but it basically it like gets in a uh, I think it's usually an arthropod and causes them to jump into into water so they drown. But it releases the worm so they can go off and yeah. parasitize something else. Well, and then the other one with the uh, the, the the psychopath uh, thing. Uh, oh, uh, uh, the name suddenly escapes me. Wolbachia. Uh, that um, uh, causes mice to lose their fear of cats oh, yeah. so that the cat can eat them and it can transfer to its main host, which is the cat. Uh, you know, I mean, it ain't nature wonderful, but if it's designed, it's just effing weird. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, what is it? There's there's one. I don't remember what it is. I, I think it's a fungus. Is it? I think it's a fungus. Uh, it basically like causes ants to crawl up on the top of grass oh, yeah, where yeah. they get eaten by cow by ungulates of some sort cows or sheep whatever and then it infects the the cows you know or sheep well and well and fungi as well are weird uh, they there there's still a little bit of a debate in lichen as to whether or not the little bacterial endosymbionts uh, with the fungi are actually getting anything out of the deal that it's, it's regarded maybe by some as more an example of an enslavement, that the bacteria are serving the little interest of the fungi. And then my favorite example of like, who would make this up? Who would design this? Is that, that fungi are predatory. There are predatory fungi. And, and the two that are the weirdest yes. is the one that makes these little like croquet hoops where the fungus is, is, makes little arcs. And when like a nematode worm crawls along, yeah and comes through it goes whoop and cinches it down and devours it there's, that's weird there's uh, and then the other that actually shoots little harpoons <laughs> into its prey <laughs> there uh actually that was preserved in amber um the the fungus that catches the nematodes and that's that's how i uh found out about that one um the i i can't remember the genus but uh there's a the fungus that parasitizes my, if my botany professor watched this, he'd probably be very mad at me. Uh, the fungus that parasitizes uh, wheat, it basically the intermediate host is is um, is a berry, is a, this berry bush, and so they they they're so hard to kill because they infect the berry bush and then they infect the wheat 
and so and they kind of yeah, go back the, and the forth. little the little cycles of some of these things it it certainly fascinated darwin and it's fascinated everybody ever since because uh, um it, those sorts of weird examples and on the opposite end uh, uh weird mutualisms uh are an area that evolutionists are absolutely fascinated with working out uh, to try to figure out how it is that organisms can come into symbiotic relationships um that that if you look at all of these fascinating, weird little topics, um, you don't find typically creationists ever investigating them. It, it doesn't fit into the narrative of the benign, fatherly creator that makes nice stuff. You get a few articles popping up every once in a while in Answers in Genesis and occasionally at ICR where they'll kind of argue that it's not really bad this parasitical thing, that it's actually providential, that it serves some higher, delightful, wonderful goal. But then again, you get the same thing with you, Ross, trying to argue that that God providentially arranges earthquakes in pl places where people aren't living or something like that, which of course yeah. is not true. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yikes, I guess. I mean, that's, yeah. that's so, I do remember the one we took, uh, was it Vibrio? What was the one we talked about in the in the book? It was digesting um, the shells. Oh yeah, it's it's not getting running there somewhere. There's some fascinating. Oh oh, on that subject, one of the things that I think it was Clary again, or maybe it was Snelling. Yeah, I think it was Snelling in as co-author. He wrote it with another guy, Dickens, I think. That his argument is the reason why we don't find stuff in the Precambrian is that vertebrates in the Precambrian is not because they weren't there, but that the overly acidic volcanic stuff that took place during the fountains of the deep dissolved all of them. Oh boy. If we found vertebrates in the Precambrian, that I, the, the evolutionists will be having a field day. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the equivalent of the Precambrian rabbit, it would be absolutely staggering, but, but it would be the matter that, that when I was, first encountering flood geology back before you were a fetus back in the 1980s a gleam in your that, father's eye and not even that yes <laughs> I'm, even... I'm getting to be old enough that i can say not even in the gleam in your father's eye from him coming about uh that uh it, it's going that old but anyway the thing is is that i envisaged i did the very thing creationists can't be caught doing you think through what would actually happen in the flood so i have no problem with a hypothesis of these giant fountains of the deep or the big ice canopy model, the air quotes, hoving theory, uh, the vapor canopy, whatever you want, and, the, and the, the, the rocks being hurled around and tidal waves and, and volcanoes and all that, that's fine. You got your toolkit. Now assemble those pieces together and figure out what the hell would be happening. So one of the things that impressed me about the fossil record and, and why it isn't flood is the absence of fossil graveyards. You do once in a while find a fossil graveyard, but they're remarkably rare in the fossil record. Some of the ones are amazingly small. There was one that that's, uh, I think Henry Morris was making a big deal out of it back in the 1970s and it got copied through the grapevine. And I think it was repeated then by Richard Milton in the 1990s. And it, I, I can't remember the name of it. It's in the, in the, the Morrison formation, I think. I went up and looked up the details of it. That deposit where a bunch of coelophysids, I think, had been caught probably in a, um, a flood, local flood, these things happen. There's hundreds of specimens of them, but they're little itty bitty animals. You know, if you've seen the second Jurassic Park movie, you've seen a coelophysid. They're the little pack hunters that go after the guy that wanders off to take a leak, I think. And so they're not very big. This Those whole deposit, this whole deposit where this mass burial had taken place is the size of my house property. I do not own Riata <laughs> Plantation. It's a, a sub, it's like about 80 feet long by about 40 feet wide, something like that altogether. If that's the size of this gigantic mass burial. Now, some other areas are bigger, and particularly if you've got lakes um, that uh, the, the uh, some of the places with the, uh, uh, the slurry, the old red sandstone and stuff involve places that were anoxic lakes where basically things swim to, into the anoxic part and they eventually get layered in and layered in and layered in. Uh, it's no coincidence. One of the things when we compiled our listing of Lagerstätten is I put in bold anoxia, 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 <laughs> that it's almost invariably the case 
that these anoxic conditions are the common feature of why you find a logger statement deposit. And they're relatively rare in the fossil record. The odds, if you go around into where you live and start digging it, you're maybe going to find cheap. They're really durable and there'll be debris and, you know, mudstones, the Dockham formation, for example, uh, in Texas again, uh, where proto Abbas comes from, um, which, by the way, I had to put in this reference in the thing. A new article from 2019 from Brian Thomas is still pushing the proto Abbas as a legitimate fossil. I know. Why? Because he's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and and he relied on all of this old stuff from Chatterjee from years ago. Oh, like it's 80s? never dawned on him to catch up with the paleontology here. This was never a legitimate taxon. Wasn't Proto Avis from like the eighties? Uh, yeah, yeah, and uh. and it was from the Dockham Formation. It was not an articulated skeleton like we find with the uh, um, Archaeopteryxes and all of that. No, it's just bits and pieces. It's probably bits and pieces of a Herrerasaur and maybe a few other taxa uh, because it's just a bunch of little stuff. And he pieced it together to form a single animal out of it. Nobody, not even Alan Fiducci, huh, <laughs> is willing to buy this thing as a legitimate taxon. So that, that should be putting a, alarm bells up. But along comes Brian Thomas going, yaggedy, 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 and repeating the same shit in the 21st century, 2019. Oh, no, 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 no. This is absolutely preposterous. Come on, well, Brewski. Yeah, well, we're we have we we went a little over the thing because we were a little bit half hour late from from the mess of things. But thank you very yeah. much, uh, and uh, hopefully I, I wasn't able to see the comments that was going on in there. We will be this is the last show for 2019, and then January 7th theoretically we will be back online. At that point, I don't have a damn thing planned for it, so it'll be all winging it. I'll try to keep, find out what happens along the way. Have we so killed contested gone. bones yet? Uh, oh, um, the um, uh, no, there's actually, it's coming along. That That's the last main chapter uh, afoot. Uh, we got maybe, let's see, I'm at uh, two nights. Nice, it's only a few pages left more, but of course, uh, because I've been working on a certain project, it's been taking up a lot of my time. Uh, yeah. That slows it down a bit. Then, then he's happen. got, their, their chapter 14 is a simpler model where I'm hoping they're going to tell us a little more about their chronology, well, but I'm nice. not holding my breath on it. That would certainly be nice. Yeah. Well, another little detail before I close down, I will point out regarding the new book that there was an. A, I want the, the the work to be comprehensive so that almost anything that the creationist throws at you, we're going to have something on, and that means being mindful of their apologetics. And it happens to be um, uh, a guy, Jeff Miller, at Reasons to Believe the Earth is Young. He's got this thing from Apologetics Press. He's part of that um, uh, a bunch. And he has a list of 21 reasons to believe the earth is young. It's available online. And what I've been doing then is marking off that we hit off every single one of those. We have? Well, that's great. Uh, well, we will be in there between that and this thing. Because he's got, uh, let's see. Uh, well, first he starts off number one, Bible teaching. The Bible says. So, therefore, that's it. Run down the list. Then he's got polystrate fossils. And nope. then DNA and ancient bacteria support a young earth. Nope. And then he's got human population statistics. That nope. would relate to the flood. Uh, carbon-14 in fossils and diamonds. Nope. Yeah. Uh, soft tissue. Nope. Yeah, that'll be in book two. Uh, human uh, dino coexistence. Nah. Nope. Uh, tightly folded rock straight up. Uh, mm. Rapid lithification. Salt uh, in the sea. Mm. Seafloor sediment. Nope. Uh, the lack of erosion between strata. Nope. Um, helium and zircons. Radio halos. Mm, plastic nope. dikes. Nope. The faint sun. The magnetic nope. field decay. Lunar nope. recession rate. Nope. Atmospheric helium. Spiral galaxies nope. and comets. So nope. between the two books, we will be picking off all the little fun and games of our little pals. Uh, I've got to, oh, we already got uh, 1, 2, 5, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 15 picked off in this book. And then the other half will come on the other. That means... Yeah. That no one is ever going to say, well, you didn't bring up, even though you've demolished this and 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 your eyes are glazing over at all of the this and this and this, but you didn't mention that. But what about this? What about this? What about this one? And and it will be advantageous because as Jackson has discovered, and boy, have I known it, is there ain't a hell of a lot of really new in creationist apologetics, you get an awful lot of the same repetition. So if you picked off 
their argument and presented what the actual scientific information is, I'm hoping that there are going to be umpteen spots in the book where you'll go, wow, I didn't know that. That's neat. And it happened to me. Uh, even if they're in an expert area in the field, they go, wow, that's I like. Yeah, I hadn't really thought of it in that way before that there will be fresh contribution in all of this. So anyway, literally, when I'm done here, in addition to having my soup for dinner, um, I'll be returning to finishing off that book. And if if the snow is in the past, uh, I'll be staying one more day here in Spokane or two, depending on there's a storm system that's coming in and I got to get over the, 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 the follow me fast. And if it's gunky, there was just rain there at the moment, but it's supposed to turn to snow and then it's supposed to warm up after a little bit. But it, it could be up. Yeah. So anyway, I'm uncertain about things. At any rate, I, I will try to finish that book down. What I will be doing then, Pelogia, bless his heart, has uh, put up a, um, uh, a cloud location so that we've been able to keep also the files put in there. So if either one of us is struck by lightning, um, we'll still have all of that material available that potentially people can make use of. Uh, but as soon as I finish chapter seven, I'm shooting it off to you. And then you get our little geologist friend to be reading through the material. And then once we're back in in the new year, um, I'll be finishing off the other chapters, getting them tidied up. And once seven is done, what you'll want to do, too, is let him know the reference bibliography, too. So what I'll do, uh, if that's OK with you, you can just pull the material off of Pelogia's cloud feed that I'll just put the files up in there and then you can download them that way rather than running around me emailing them and then forward those on to him because he'll need to see the source material, I think, uh, to be able to check to find out if this little obscure paper is that and make sure it's going along on it. I, I, it. The material that he had previously on the radiometric dating thing, I was quite satisfied with because we didn't we made no mistakes. We, we made a few little adjustments and a few commentaries. I'm hoping here we'll get kind of a, whoa, have you covered a lot? <laughs> and that it will be ridiculously current and 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 absolutely wonderfully informative that that it's it's although it's about geology it's about so much more than just the geology and it's so much about paleontology and integrating the biogeography and paleoclimate issue together and it, it uh, i had a challenge on it to pull this additional material in together and restructure the material plus making sure the reference bibliography and all that's up to speed so um, we're proceeding apace. Um, everybody that can help out in any way with the Patreon and or uh, the GoFundMe thing, you can find that at my website. Um, those of you who have already gotten Slam Dunk, uh, let people know about it. Uh, tell people upstairs about things. Tell groups. Um, let uh, FFRF or any other bunch uh, know about it. Say, hey, have you read this book? Uh, and um, uh, needless to say, uh, the old RJ appreciates all the royalties that I get from everybody that gets the book. But also, you can be honest about it, the fact that if you're not enjoying the book, you should say so on the reviews. But if you do enjoy the book and feel this is a good contribution, then let everybody know about it. Because I'm coming in from the lower echelon thing. I don't have a publication thing. I don't have a university or a um, um, Houghton Mifflin or something like that to act as uh, an arranger. I'm just coming out from the envelope and say, hey. I, I just vaporized creationist on the reptile mammal transition. You should get this. And we'll be doing the same on a bunch of other stuff too. So uh, see everybody in 2020. Have a safe and happy new year. Uh, don't, uh, don't accept any wooden penguins.